I'm live. What's up, Facebook? I'm bringing Periscope, Periscope up. So I clocked in just a little bit early because I've discovered that if I come on just a little bit late, y'all leave or you think I'm not coming. <laughs> so I uh, thought I'd just clock in just a little bit early so you would know that I'm here. On my post, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, ready to deliver the word of the Lord. Okay? All right. <clears throat> All right. There's my sister. Hello, sis. Say hi to my sister. All right. Now, uh, Brooklyn Native, hey there, on Periscope. Uh, now, remember, when you come on the video, please like and share. Okay, please like and share the video because whenever a prophetic word goes forth from the Lord, it's important that as many people as possible can hear it. Now, I believe in God for many, many souls to come into the kingdom through my ministry. I want many, many people to get born again because it doesn't matter if you understand everything about the Lord or everything that you need to know or whatever, if you don't get A's in every class. It's like the Lord said, it's more important to enter into life, even if you enter in uh, crippled halt, and lame if you're not totally whole. And what we want is for people to come into a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and become born again. Like you, you were born one time physically from your mother's womb, the seed of your father grown in the womb of your mother, that is Adam's nature that you inherited with that. But what we want is to inherit God's nature through Jesus Christ. That's why we have to be born again. And one of the perks of being born again is not, not only do you get your sins forgiven, wiped off your record, not only do you get your sins cleansed, meaning you don't have to live in them anymore, but you also get eternal life. That's just part of the, the basic package of being a Christian once you become born again. So like I said, I have been believing God. I've been praying and confessing. I believe God that many souls will come into the kingdom through my ministry. And even after I'm dead, that the spirit of God will use my words, my books and my videos and my everything to continue to reach out and convict people and pull them into a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm really excited about that. Um, because all things are possible to him that believe it. So I need your help. So anybody in my audience, anybody listening to me on the podcast, anybody watching me live or watching the replay, when you uh, experience this ministry, please like and share so that as many people as possible can hear the prophetic word of God and the prophetic teaching so that they will have a chance to become born again. They will have a chance to get to know Jesus, get their sins forgiven, get their sins cleansed and get their names written in the book of life so they can live forever. Okay. Cause we at least need to get that from God. That's the salvation package. Now there's plenty of stuff to build on top of that, but we at least need to get that. If we don't get that, that means that we have to pay for our own sins. And I know people don't understand what that means. If you don't become saved, if you don't accept Jesus blood as your payment, that means you have chosen to stand before God on your own. There is no intermediary. There is no mediator. There is no lawyer for your defense. All that is Jesus. That's why, I mean, because I've had people ask me, why do you believe that Christ is the only way to God? Because you need somebody to defend you because the wages of sin is death. So either, <clears throat> I'll tell you how I witnessed to my son when he was a very little boy. Either you accept that Jesus paid for your sins and you accept his payment and then God wipes your slate clean or you have to pay because sin has to be paid for and you innately know that. How do I know that you know that? I know that you know that because when somebody sets up a Ponzi scheme and robs the retirement of a bunch of senior citizens and makes themselves rich off of money that people have worked their whole lives to save, when that happens, you want to see some arrests. You want to see an orange jumpsuit, you want to see chains, and you want to see some type of prison conviction and sentence. 
Why? Because innately, you know, that sin has to be paid for. But we deceive ourselves by saying that we can talk about other people and the stuff that they do wrong uh, and how they need to pay for their sins. But no, you have to pay for yours. Yours have to be paid for as well. So when you stand before a holy, just God, you can either choose to defend yourself or you can let Jesus defend with his blood because his blood is the only payment that the bank of heaven accepts for sin. If you come before God without the blood of Jesus, you will be empty handed. And the only thing that you will have to show for your life is your sins, because we think that good works pay for sins. That's not true. You should have good works, but good works don't pay for sin. We think that morals and ethics pay for sin. You should have high moral and ethical standards for sure, but that doesn't pay for sin. The only thing that pays for sin is shed blood. So that's why people can't convince me. I believe in Christ, not because of some emotional appeal or not because of something I saw when I was a kid per se, or not because of a bunch of emotional rousology or a lot of the things that people think about Christians, especially black Christians. I believe in the Lord because I understand the legal reality of either I have to pay or I believe that he paid and God through his grace wipes my slate clean. It's not based on anything that I do. I don't have to earn it. I don't have to deserve it. God does it because he's good, not because I'm good. And all I have to do is believe it and receive it. Then he wipes my account clean with his blood. Then he wipes my spirit clean. So I don't have to live that way anymore with his blood and his word and the filling of his Holy Ghost. And then he grants me eternal life and I'm a part of his kingdom. And then he says, now that you're a part of my kingdom, you have an opportunity to build a life that's going to mean something unto life eternal. Or you can build a life that's just going to burn up when you die. You have that choice too. See, so it's not, it's not this, this, you know, emotional thing. That's what you black people do. You do backflips down the middle of the aisle and you jump up and, ooh, and you're thank you, Jesus. I got the holy of that. No, nothing wrong with that. And I do praise God like that. But that's not why I'm saved. I'm saved because I understand how it works. And I understand innately that sin has to be paid for. And we as humans, when you see somebody else do something wrong, when you see somebody fill their body full of alcohol, climb behind the wheel of a car and kill others, then you get mad and they need to be arrested and they need to pay. And they took the people's lives and that's vehicular manslaughter and blah, 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 all of which is true. Okay, well that tells me then you innately understand crime and punishment and we do. Okay, well, what about your crimes? So that's why the son of God became Jesus Christ. Through his love and through his grace, he said, I will go to the cross. I will let the punishment be taken into my body. So for all the stuff that David did wrong, Jesus said, I'll take it in my body and I'll actually die to pay for what David did. So David doesn't have to pay. And then I'm going to get raised from the grave because none of the sins I die for were mine, says Jesus. So the grave can't hold me because the devil has nothing to accuse him of. So God beat the devil at his own game. Then Jesus said, I'm going to take the blood that was shed. And through faith, if you believe it, I'm going to apply it to your account. So now everything on your account that's not right before God, my blood washes it away once and for all time. And everything in your spirit that's not right, my blood, my word, and the Holy Ghost will wash you every day. So you can become more what you're supposed to be. And now you're going to live forever. Why did you do all that for me, Jesus? Because I love you. And because I want you to live. That's why as many people as possible need to hear and understand what I just said. The basic message of salvation, become born again. And if you're listening to me or watching me right now, if you are not right with God through Jesus Christ, become born again and know his love and know his grace and know his mercy and know his forgiveness for yourself. And all you have to do to do that is ABC. Admit you're a sinner, believe Jesus is the son of God, and confess that with your mouth as you're believing in your heart. And God will do all those wonderful things I've been talking about. And if not, then when you die, well, actually judgment comes before you die. But anyway, you're going to have to stand before God on your own. And what people think is the color of my skin makes me right. That's not true. 
My money makes me right. But I work with senior citizens, but I work with teenagers. I work with troubled children. Those are all good things, but good works don't pay for sin. Only shared blood pays for sin. So either you take Jesus' blood on your account or you're going to have to pay. And that's what hell is for. Hell is for the devil and his angels. Hell was not meant for people. Earth was meant for people. That's why earth has atmosphere. But when people started listening to the devil, if you do what the devil did, you're going to get what the devil got. So then you have chosen to pay and you have chosen to stay in your sins. And God is not going to allow that into his kingdom, just like he didn't let Lucifer stay in heaven once he became a sinner. He's not going to let you enter the kingdom if you're still a sinner. It's not it's not difficult. <laughs> OK, it's not difficult. So that's why I want you to share this video in, in as many places as you can. Uh, so if someone is not born again, so they can understand the simplicity and they can become born again. And if they just hear the explanation and they ABC, admit, believe and confess, they can get saved on the spot. And now you never have to see hell. You never have to worry about it because Jesus already went to hell for you. Hmm, good God Almighty. Okay, that's not the prophetic word, but that's the, the preamble to let you know why you should like and share the video because it's going to save souls. Okay, all right. So we got a prophetic word for today. We're going to say a word of prayer. We're going to jump right in. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for all the good things you do for us all, uh, all day, oh God, that we can't even number. Every breath that we draw, every beat of our heart, every right thought in our heads. Thank you, oh Jesus, for shedding your blood. We can't thank you enough, oh God, for your shed blood, Lord. We can't praise you enough. And God, you did it because you're good, oh God, not because we're good. And I'm so glad that you're a good God. <clears throat> I'm so glad you don't base it on anything that we do. So I ask you to breathe through me right now, oh God. I turn this broadcast over to you. I surrender. I die to myself so that you can become alive in me. So let the words spoken, I surrender every part of myself to you. So let everything spoken be so that you might be glorified, that the saints might be edified, that hell might be terrified, and that sinners might be challenged to become born again and miss the penalty of hell because you have opened your hand in grace. And I thank you for this opportunity to be used of you. And we're expecting great things. And I declare and decree that signs and wonders and miracles do follow them that believe. So all those that receive and believe this word will have the manifestation and the very spirit of God himself will put his power into a sign of wonder and a miracle to validate the prophetic and uh, prophetic teaching word of God. I thank you for it and I believe you for it in Jesus name, amen. All right, amen and amen. <clears throat> Today's prophetic word <clears throat> is around the corner. What'd you say prophet? I said, today's prophetic word is around the corner. We'll explain. Let's look at our scripture reference. Our scripture reference is Acts 1 and 5. Acts 1 and 5. Acts is uh, the fifth book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts in the New Testament. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with the Bible, if you're not familiar with the scriptures, um, after the Lord resurrected from the dead, he only stayed on earth 40 days after that. So he was only on earth like a month and then 10 more days or so after he resurrected from the dead. And then he went back to heaven because to continue the salvation work, Jesus had to go back to heaven for a lot of different reasons, like to pour out his blood on the mercy seat, to become the go between between God and man, to receive all his rewards for all the work he had done. So there's a lot of reasons that the Lord had to leave. But the Lord said, <clears throat> that he wasn't going to leave us just on earth by ourselves. So then we, when he went back to heaven, he was gonna send the Holy Ghost back so that the spirit of God can actually indwell each one of us and be with us just like Jesus was still here in the flesh. And so the book of Acts is about what happened right after Jesus did that. So the book of Acts starts out with uh, them gathering together right after Jesus had ascended because all of the people that believed in the Lord actually watched him go up on the cloud. They stood there and they watched the Lord float up until he floated out of sight. So if you had had that experience, you would have been like, what do we do now? 
<laughs> so the Lord told them to go to Jerusalem and, and tarry, and we're going to look at the verse, and then the Spirit of God was going to fall, and that the Spirit of God was going to be a comforter, a teacher, and he was basically going to be Jesus's presence with them and in them so that they could continue to spread the message of the kingdom. So the book of Acts is about those early days after Peter, James, and John, because James got killed really early in the mix. The three that were closer to Jesus, that James got killed really early in the mix. But Peter, James, and John, and the other disciples, the other 11, because Judas had killed himself, and then Mary and Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Salome, and then all the people that actually saw the Lord alive, because the Bible says the Lord actually showed himself to 500 people or a little above 500 people. So, so those people saw Jesus actually after he came out of the grave and then they watched him grow up. And so then they gathered together because they were like, we've got to continue his work. But the Lord said, go to Jerusalem and tarry until the Holy Ghost comes and the Holy Ghost will give you power. Then you're going to be witnesses to me. Okay, so the book of Acts is about all those early days about what they did right after Jesus left and everything that meant and everything that they went through and all the struggles that they had and all that. That's what the book of Acts is about. OK, so having given you that background, <clears throat> I'm going to read actually verses uh, four and five. So we're going to read Acts chapter one, uh, verses four and five. Uh, first one is Berean Study Bible. And while they were gathered together, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift the Father promised, which you have heard me discuss. Verse five, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized, <clears throat> baptized with the Holy Spirit. New International Version, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So same as Brian. Uh, New Living Translation, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. English Standard Version, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay? Now, to give you a brief background again, when the Lord says, for John baptized with water, he's not talking about the Apostle John. He's talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Jesus's first cousin because Jesus's mom, Mary, was sister to John the Baptist's mom, Elizabeth, okay? So John the Baptist is actually Jesus's first cousin. John the Baptist's ministry was to point people to the fact that Jesus was on earth now. And so John's baptism with water was symbolic of the baptism of repentance towards sins. So in other words, John was sent to prepare the people to receive Messiah. So his water baptism was saying, we're willing to die to the old life. We want to wash away the old life so we can receive Messiah and the new life. So the Lord kind of bookends that by saying, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So in other words, the Spirit of God, the indwelling Spirit of God is the one that gives us the witness that we're actually born again. The Holy Ghost will witness inside of your spirit that you are a child of God. Now, don't get caught up in how that looks because it's different for different people. I grew up around people that were so filled with the Holy Ghost. They would cry out. They would speak in tongues. They would, a whole lot of things would happen. It was very demonstrative. And it's different for different people because some people just throw their hand up. Some people go into tongues. Some people start dancing. Some people start crying. Some people feel a quickening of their body. It's like they grabbed electrical wires and you can see them shake uh, because the way the Spirit of God manifests in different people is different. So don't get hung up on how it looks. Just know that if you are saved, the Holy Ghost will witness to your spirit that you truly are a Christian. And if you can't get that inner witness, you better check and see if you really say. You better check and see if you ever did actually ABC like you're supposed to. OK, so the Lord is saying that it's a bookend to John's water baptism of repentance towards sin and the new life that only comes through the filling of the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, all of that was not the prophetic word. <laughs> all of that was just the background. Let me give you the prophetic word. <clears throat> the prophetic word is a few days from now. The prophetic word is just around the corner. 
The prophetic word is not many days hence. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. This is the difference between preaching, prophesying, and prophetic teaching. Because to prophesy means to speak by divinely inspired utterance, to say things that only the Holy Ghost would give you to say. That's why people that don't have the prophetic dimension in their lives are, are never working on all cylinders. Okay. The Holy Ghost told me to release to the body of Christ that so much of what you have been waiting for, believing God for, is just around the corner. Just a few days from now, you're going to have that money in your hand. Just a few days from now, you're going to have that relationship in your life. Just a few days from now, you're going to see the manifestation of things you've been believing God for, for years. How can I make a statement like that? Because I've seen God do things that I've been praying for, for decades. I've seen God do things. I've seen miracles manifest, stuff I never thought I'd see in this life. And I'm seeing God do stuff that, that only he can do. Well, there are some of you that have been, you've been praying, you've been fasting, you've been crying out to God. Let me see if I can go in the spirit and give you some details so you know I'm not making that up. Oh, Prophet Taylor, you could just say stuff like that because anybody can say it. Okay, then let me ask the Holy Ghost for some details. Okay. All right, some of y'all have on blue right now. I'm seeing a blue dress. Some of y'all have been crying out to God for your husband because you don't feel like your husband understands you. Some of you have been crying out to have a baby. Some of you have been crying out for deliverance or some things you want to be free from because they feel like a yoke around your neck. Some of it is guilt from the past. Some of it is shame. Uh, a lot of y'all been crying out to God for Lord, when is this pandemic going to be over? <laughs> when can, when, you know, when we going to be free, when we're, how long we got to deal with this? Um, some of y'all been crying out to God for your mother because your mother is older and you're not quite sure what to do with her. And it's, and it's been weighing on, it's been stressing you out because you feel like she's a burden on your back because now she's older and can't really take care of herself. And you don't really know how long you can go on and what you need to do. Oh man, some of y'all, some of y'all done fooled around during this time and got some viruses, like the chicken pox. Like some bacteria, some other viruses, some flu, some influenza, not just COVID. Y'all done fooled around and got some other diseases while all this other stuff is going on. And you're like, and, uh, Some, a lot of people have been waiting on a financial breakthrough. Uh, some of y'all are having kidney problems. You're having problems in your gut, kidneys, or maybe your spleen or your appendix, Or, but I'm seeing kidneys. Uh, some of y'all have been struggling with balance. You've been asking God, Lord, help me to balance the scales. I need balance in my life. I don't know how to do everything you're trying to get me to do, so I need to balance out. Uh, I'm seeing different ethnic groups, black people and white people for sure. Um, some of y'all have been struggling with unbelief. Some of y'all have been saying to God, God, can you really do this? Or God, will you do it for me? I'm seeing... Definitely, I'm seeing a lot of people with glasses on, got them glasses on. Some of y'all got that look down the nose, you look with glasses, you know that look. Um, hearing, some of y'all got stopped ears all the way down here. And you want God to make that pop out so you can hear. <laughs> some of y'all been praying about braces and crooked teeth. Some of y'all wish your smile was better. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make <laughs> is that, see, once again, that's why you have to go in the Holy Ghost, because all that was Holy Ghost. That's not me. I'm just a person just like you. How would I know that? I know that by the Spirit of God. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And the Holy Ghost is saying that some of this stuff that we've been crying out about, some of this stuff we've been crying out for a long time, just a few days, it's around the corner. It's just a few days from now. It's just, oh, 
Oh, it's just a few days from now. Now that, when you get a blessed word like that from God, that 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 is nothing but a vote of confidence. That is nothing but but sheer grace. Because God don't have to tell us when we've been walking in faith, the Lord don't have to tell us. But when he does stuff like that, he's trying to keep you encouraged. He's trying to know, he wants you to hang in there. He don't want you to give up because a lot of people give up two steps from their blessing. You do realize that it doesn't matter how well you run a race if you don't finish, right? <clears throat> I'm not gonna call the name, but I know more than one person who got down to one class before they degree and dropped out of college and never went back. Why, <laughs> why would you spend all that money all that time and work that hard to get down to one class and then not finish and not get your degree? See, God doesn't want us to do that. God wants us to finish as strong as we started. So let me give you a picture because marriage is like this too. At the, it's like a marathon at the beginning of the race. What are people doing? They're jumping around, they're warming up, they're chest bumping, they fist bumping, they high fiving, woohoo! That's at the beginning of a race. Uh huh. But I used to volunteer for the Red Cross, and the Red Cross taught us about how to deal with people in marathons, because there's a lot of marathons here in Chicago. Is the people always overestimate their strength and underestimate how much help they gonna need. So they taught us to set up triage centers anyway, because the marathon runners are all gonna say, we don't need that, we don't need that, we don't need that. Uh -uh. Okay, let me tell you what happens about halfway to three quarters of the way through a marathon. You know what'll happen? You get dehydrated and then your muscles begin to knot. You haven't felt no pain until you felt the pain of dehydrated muscles knotting. You may have felt no pain until you felt pain like that. That pain will stop you in your tracks and double you over because your muscles won't even work. And so they taught us, get the water ready. And if you have to, run beside them and give them the water because they ain't going to want the water because they're going to be, woohoo, yeah, we mad now. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Their muscles are going to start to cramp. They're going to have to hydrate whether they like it or not, but they're not going to make it. That's why when you get to the end of a marathon, you see so few people hit the finish line. Look at the number of people that start and look at the number of people that actually finish a marathon. You can start with 100 folks. You might finish with 20. The rest of them folks stopped and passed out, but they did like that one man that one year they cheated and went around the short one in, came at the end, woohoo, everybody's like, how you finish so fast? He's like, well, I don't know. Yeah, you a liar. But anyway, so the point I'm trying to make is you don't get a reward if you don't finish. God knows that. So God says, just like for the Red Cross, where we have to physically set up a triage center along the way in the marathon to give the runners water and give them a sponge. If your skin is hot, you know what it's like trying to deal with your skin when your skin is hot to the touch, okay? And your body is just out of moisture. Well, that's what the Holy Ghost is doing now in the spirit. In the spirit, the Holy Ghost is coming alongside us and within us and saying, here's some water of the word to refresh you, to let you know that it's just a few days or it's just around the corner that you've been running for a long time in some cases. You've been believing God for a long time in some cases. And when you get into real faith, now I hate to use that phrase because it's too churchy. I don't like churchy religious stuff because it doesn't carry a practical application. But what I mean when I say real faith is I mean, you have been believing God for stuff that there's no sensory evidence that it could happen or it's gonna happen. You've been believing God for stuff that's so far above your ability until if God don't do it, <laughs> it ain't gonna be done. That's what I mean. <clears throat> and when you have to believe God like that, sometimes it's easy. The Bible says we're not supposed to be weary and well-doing for due season. We're gonna reap if we faint not. But the Bible wouldn't say that if being weary and fainting wasn't a temptation, wasn't an option, wasn't a possibility. And so the Holy Ghost is coming with the fresh water of the prophetic word to let you know that it's just around the corner. 
So keep running. So take the water of this word that's coming through right now. Take this and meditate this. Oh, uh, yeah. My son's saying the trenches of faith. That's right. In the trenches. Uh, I'm going to use that. Let me speak on that. You know what a trench is? If you've ever seen a war movie or if you've been in the military, a trench is where they've dug down beneath the surface of the earth and they've hollowed out a space for the soldiers to hide. So you peek your head up and try not to get shot. Maybe you take, take out some opponents or you set up something where you can launch missiles, but you have to have a place to hide when they return fire. That's what a trench is. And also that's how you build close bonds and relationships with people because we have that phrase, we've been in the trenches together. We've been in war together. And that's why we're so tight. That's what that means. So the Holy Ghost is saying that if you've had that experience, that it just around the corner is your deliverance, is your victory. It's where you're going to hold it out here in your hand. So he's trying to give you the water of refreshment to let you know not to give up because you don't want to give up before the blessing comes. I like the way Marilyn Hickey says it, it's not over until we win. Let me give you a very pointed example. And once you hear me say what I'm about to say, it's going to change your life. Let me give you a pointed example. <clears throat> the Bible never names Mary as Jesus' mom. The Bible says in Isaiah 7, 14, behold, the virgin shall conceive. And it picks it up again in Matthew 21, 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay. The Bible never names Mary. Do you understand what that means? When Gabriel came and told Mary that she was chosen to be the mother of Messiah. She didn't know that she had gotten the attention of heaven to be slotted as Jesus's mom. Because when, how do we know that? Because when Gabriel came and talked to Mary, she didn't say, oh, whew, Gabriel, I'm so glad you made it. I think he's going to be here at 6.30. Let's get the show on the road. What's next? That ain't what Mary said. Mary said, how can these things be since I don't know a man? Mary found out in the scripture when we find out, when we read it, Mary found out in real time when Gabriel appeared to her. Do you understand that that means if Mary had decided not to be a virgin at any point in her life before that time, Gabriel would have flown by her. And it would have been Susie, the mother of Jesus. It would have been Johanna, the mother of Jesus, it would have been whoever else. Because the Bible said a virgin shall conceive. That means that Mary had to keep herself sexually pure until the day she met Gabriel. And she didn't even know that Gabriel was coming. That means if she had given away her purity, Mary would have never been Jesus' mom because the Bible said, behold, a virgin shall conceive, but the Bible never names her. Do you understand what that means? That means that there are some blessings where you have to stay on course because in some cases, you don't even know what God is trying to do in your life. And if you run off over here in the sin, you're going to end up missing the whole boat. Mary would have missed her divine destiny. Mary would have lost her place in history if she had decided to have sex with Joseph or any man before Gabriel got to her. She would have disqualified herself because the Bible never names her. <laughs> the Bible doesn't point out Jesus' mom until we read it. Mary didn't know who she was until Gabriel stopped her and said, Hail Mary, full of grace, thou art blessed and highly favored among women. And Mary was like, what are you talking about? She didn't know. That means if Mary had gotten out of the path and gotten over into sin and given away her purity, Gabriel would have flown right by her. She would have disqualified herself and she would have never known she had a chance to be Jesus's mom. That's going to mess with your head for a very long time. <clears throat> we have, when I say we, I mean spiritual leaders, have spent too much time 
talking about everything that God's supposed to do and not enough time talking about what we're supposed to do. And what we're supposed to do is stay on track. And sometimes staying on track means there's no sensory evidence around you to tell you what's happening. You have to do it by faith. You have to do it because you believe what God says is true. It doesn't matter what your senses say. It doesn't matter what thoughts jump over in your head. It doesn't matter what the devil whispers in your ear. It doesn't matter what the people around you say. It doesn't matter. All that you know is that God told me to do this. The Lord told me to step out and I'm going to believe what God said is true. But that truth is so deep until some blessings are like Mary's blessing. If you get over off track, you're going to miss the whole everything. That's what a lot of believers don't understand. Did that happen to somebody else in the Bible? Yes, it did. King Saul. God told the children of Israel that they didn't need a king. They asked him. They said they wanted a monarchy. God said, you have a theocracy. You have me leading you directly. And I speak to you through the prophets. And I lead you as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God said, you have me. You don't need a human king on the throne. No, God, we want a king. All the other nations had kings. Why can't we have a king? So they worried God till he said, okay. Didn't take but three kings for them to get split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and they never recovered. But anyway, first king was a king they picked. They picked a man named Saul. And God, uh, Samuel, God through Samuel, told them what kind of man Saul was going to be. But God said this to Samuel. God said, if you had obeyed me, I would have established you and your throne forever. But now I have rent the kingdom from you. Rent means torn. I have torn the kingdom from you and given it to a neighbor that's better than you. That was talking about King David. God told Saul, I didn't want a monarchy. I didn't want a king. And I definitely didn't want you. But if you had done what I told you to do, God would have blessed Saul the way he blessed David. And Saul blew it. You know what happened after that? Saul got cursed with schizophrenia. The Lord stopped talking to him. And Saul lived long enough to watch David rise up on the come up. He messed up. He got out the way. And that opportunity never came back. I'm going to give you one more example. Okay. This stuff going to mess with your head long after what I'm saying here, because we have spent too much time giving people the idea that the will of God is just going to happen irrespective of what you do. That's not biblical. Let me give you another example, because this happened to a lot of people in the Bible. You just haven't heard it in this context before. I'm going to give you one more example. Another example is Judas, Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot, okay, you need to understand, understand something about Jesus being on earth, okay? God turning himself into a man by coming through the womb of a woman was not once in a lifetime. That was not once in a generation. Like once in a generation is a voice like Aretha Franklin's or a voice like Whitney Houston. There's going to be other great singers or a basketball player like Michael Jordan. So we all, you know, live to see them in their day. But there will come in other generations, another voice like that. But voices like that are pretty much once in a generation. Ain't nobody like Gladys Knight. Ain't nobody like Rita Franklin. Ain't nobody like Whitney Houston. Ain't nobody like Michael Jackson. Prince, uh, Michael Jordan. That's kind of once a generation you get people on that level. But it will happen again because it happened before. The birth of Christ, God turned himself into a man, was not once in a lifetime. It was not once in a generation. It was once in all creation. There was only one time God was going to incarnate, incarnate himself as a human and come through the womb of a woman and walk the earth like we do in human form. That only happened once in all. That means from Adam until the end. God only did that one time. There's lots of manifestations of God in the Old Testament, but he ain't never turned himself into a human by being born through a birth canal and being a baby. And growing up and going through puberty and experiencing life like we do, he only did that one time. And Jesus ain't never coming back to die again. He ain't never going to be in Mary's womb again. That was once in all of creation. And them 12 men and them half a dozen women that got to follow Jesus, 
got an opportunity that literally nobody else will ever get. Jesus told Judas from the beginning, don't do what I know you're going to do. The Lord kept warning Judas over and over and over and over again. Don't let the devil jump in your heart. It would actually be better for you that you had never been born if you end up doing what I know you're going to do, which is betray me to the Roman government and sell me out till I get arrested and beaten and crucified. You're going to betray the body and blood of Christ. Jesus told Judas, don't do that. Don't let the devil get in your heart. I know what the devil tried to do. Jesus like, I see you, devil. You don't fool me. But Jesus tried to tell Judas, don't let that happen in your heart. He told him over and over. Just look up the scriptures. You'll see what the Lord said. Haven't I not chosen you 12? And one of you is a devil. And very, verily, one of you shall betray me. The Lord said it over and over because he was trying to give Judas a chance to understand. Don't let Satan do in your heart what he trying to do. And what did Judas do? He did it anyway. And he became the betrayer of the body and blood of Christ. How would you like to stand before Father God in judgment? And you're the one that sold Jesus into the hands of the Roman soldiers. And they spit on him and they beat on him and they tore off his clothes and they whipped him. And that was when they first arrested him. And they went to sleep and they woke up and they beat him some more. Read the Bible. And they put him on the cross at nine o'clock on the morning. And he stayed on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., six hours. How would you like to be the one that did that, that sold Jesus out like that? And so there's two different accounts of how Judas dies. One account says that he hung himself. And one account says that his guts burst forth in a field. Maybe both things happen. Maybe it's like the walking dead. Maybe he hung himself and then his guts burst out. I don't know. But the Bible gives two separate accounts. Maybe he did hang himself and his rotting corpse was hanging up there. I don't know. All I know is once you're Judas, you can't go back. You can't come back from that. So Judas had a chance to be in the 12. Now, there are, there's more than 12 apostles and there's still apostles and prophets now, but there's only one set of the 12, meaning the 12 men that Jesus chose personally to follow him when he walked over as a man. And Judas had a chance to be a part of that group and he sold the Lord out. Oh, see, it's just something inside me tremble when I say that because I'm trying to get you to understand once your, your one-time opportunities. I'm trying to get you to understand because we don't spend too much time talking about God's part. That's what get people shouting and God's going to do this and God said this show. Yeah. Oh, no, thank you. Hope oh, help you. That kind of, uh-huh. We do all that, but we don't spend no time talking about our part. What, what are we supposed to do? And so, just like running that marathon, what we have to do is we have to hold fast because Mary's blessing was tied into her being a virgin. That means all she had to do was lay with one man one time and she forever loses that destiny. King Saul wasn't even supposed to be king. They weren't supposed to have a monarchy. And God said, if you had just obeyed me, you know all the Psalms and the music and all the stuff that David wrote and how David is the greatest king of Israel and everybody knows King David to this day. Even us Gentiles know who King David of the Jews is. That would have been Saul. And he blew it. And Judas, I just told you that story. It hurts my brain because what do you do when you arrive in the afterlife and you're Judas? Where literally the body and blood of Christ is on your head. How, you can't come back from that. How? You're the one that sold them out to the Romans. You can't come back. I see, I don't even want to understand the level of hell that Judas lives in. Because it would be hell just living with the knowledge. More or less, whatever else is, whatever other kind of punishment Father God put on him. Because remember, Judas had to look at Jesus again. He had to look at him right in the face. That face with the eyes that burn like fire and the hair like wool, the resurrected Christ. Judas had to look right at that. Okay? He had to look right at that. So what I'm trying to say to you is that we need to hang in there. We don't want to get off the path. We don't want to get off the path. 
We don't want to get off the path because the Holy Ghost says it's just, it's just around the corner. Now, why have I spent all this time giving you all these intense examples? I will tell you why. Because when you come into the last leg of a journey in the natural, your body wants to give up and your body might start breaking down and you've got to fight to get. Have you ever tried to graduate anything? Junior high, high school, community college, two year university, four year university, uh, university, tech school, master's program. Have you ever tried to graduate anything? What happens in that last semester? Good gravy from the Navy. I know what I'm talking about. That last semester. Look like you got to push harder than you've been pushing all the mother three, four years behind you. That last semester, laziness comes, lethargy comes, or sometimes stuff happens where people get on your nerves so bad. People just people just start doing stuff to get underneath your skin so bad. You get so angry, it's so easy to get distracted. Because when you get to the last leg, my son said the last leg is when the crazy happens. That's right. When you get to that last leg, You've got to push like you haven't pushed before, okay? That's in the natural. Same is true when a woman's giving birth. Whatever kind of labor pain she'd be going in and make that womb open, and ever long she had to wait for that service to dilate. When it's time to push the baby out, it's that last push for women because they don't have no more left. They're like, if this baby don't come now, I don't know what y'all gonna do. That's in the natural. Uh, graduating, birthing babies, running marathons. But in the spirit, what happens is that the devil starts doing ridiculous amounts of things. I wish I could give you my testimony because some stuff I can't tell. I wish I could tell you, but just trust me when I say. <laughs> devil starts doing insane things, things that literally don't make any sense. Do you know why the devil does that? He does that because he wants you to give up. He does that because he wants you to give up, because he wants you to give up. He wants you to give up right in the last leg, and you're not going to get the reward unless you finish. So that's why we need to receive, because remember, as the Holy Ghost breathes, breathes it through me, I'm here too. And we need to receive what the Holy Ghost is saying. At least to say frustration kicks in and you start reacting out of self. That's right, you get in your flesh. Or as we say now, you get in your feelings. So we need to receive what the Holy Ghost is saying, that these blessings, because remember, remember what we have to do when we fight. When I say we, I mean believers. What do we have to do when we fight? The first thing we have to do is we have to pray. Next thing we have to do is we have to memorize scripture. Because the third thing we have to do is we have to confess the word. And if you haven't learned that, you will learn. Just, just stay with the Lord long enough. He'll teach you. He'll teach you to stop saying what you don't want and start saying what you do more. He'll teach you to stop saying what you see and start saying what God said. He'll teach you to stop saying what you think and start, start saying what thus saith the Lord. If you look at the way Jesus operated when he was a man, he did that all the time. When he told Peter to come walk on the water, did he say, Peter, you better be careful. There's a storm going on out here. That ain't what the Lord said. The Lord said, come, did he? Just study Jesus' life. You will see that when the Lord talked, he wasn't ever magnifying his circumstances, ever. He learned. And that's what I mean when I say he going to teach you. So we got to pray. We got to read the scripture. We got to believe. We got to confess. Sometimes we fast. And then sometimes we go into that warfare prayer where you're praying in tongues, where you're praying where your prayer language takes over. And then another level is where the Holy Ghost takes over and the Spirit of God is interceding. The Spirit of, Spirit of God is talking to Father and Son on a level that only they understand. It might be coming out of your mouth, but it's actually the Holy, and you can feel the difference when the Holy Ghost takes over. It's completely different. Another thing that has to happen is we have to go through the fire because what God uses the process for is to burn away everything that's not like him. That's one of the benefits of being a Christian, that God is saying that whenever the, whenever the devil is coming to try to destroy you, I'm going to take what the devil is doing and use it to make you better. By the time you get through with the process, you will be more like Christ than ever. But that involves some burning away of things that are not like God. That involves some cutting away 
and some things that are not like God. And you look at other people sometimes living their lives and you're like, they look like they don't have to go through certain stuff. Look like they just do whatever they want. But if you're a believer, what God is trying to do is he's trying to get you ready for the blessing that's already yours. That's what he uses the process for because the process is not the point. It's the peaceable fruit of righteousness that it produces. That's the point because when he gets ready to lay that blessing on you, you have to be able to handle it. So think of it like this. Every promise in the Bible, I like what Jesse Duplantis says, there's not one lie in the Bible. Every promise in the Bible is true. You don't have to earn your blessings. They were already yours before the foundation of the world and they are ours in Christ. But what you do have to do is let God prepare you for your blessings so you can handle them. So think about giving car keys to a nine-year-old. Why would you ever give car keys to a nine-year-old? You can't even reach the pedals unless you're extraordinarily tall when you're nine. But if you're like an average nine-year-old, your feet don't even go all the way down to the floor. Why would you put your nine-year-old up on it? What's going to happen? <laughs> What's going to happen with this right here? You're not telling your child no. You're telling your child not now. Not yet. Yes, but there needs to be some preparation first. You got to grow. You got to physically grow, but also dad needs to see if you can handle responsibility. I need to see you mentally, emotionally grow. I need to see you handle some responsibility. You got to grow because I'm not telling you no. I'm telling you, you need to prepare so you can handle the car. Do you understand that? It's just like that, except when God does stuff like that, that's in the in, uh, invisible, that's in the spiritual realm. People see you acting different out here and they're like, oh, wow, so-and-so has really changed because you know all the work that's been going on in here. So the Holy Ghost is saying that we don't need to lose out on all the fight of faith that we've done up to this point, all the fast and the praying and the crying. Because you know, when you get in your when you get in your prayer closet or your prayer room, when you get alone with the Lord, there is no need to pretend. And if you don't know that yet, then just keep living. You, you see what I mean? Because you will come to a point where you strip off all your pride and all your mask and all your pretense and you humble yourself before the Lord. You even learn how to lay prostrate, which is face down to the ground. God, I'm coming to you as humble as I know how. That ain't about who's around. It ain't about who's looking. That's about God. I need you to hear me. You understand? And so there's so much that God does in our lives to make us more like Christ and to burn away the ways of the flesh along the process as we're running the marathon. But you don't want to get right to the last steps and then not hit the tape and get your reward. So the Holy Ghost is saying it's around the corner. It's around, oh, it's around the corner. So that means between the moment of you hearing this word, and what I'm going to do, just start praising God because the devil might come up with some crazy stuff between now and then. It's around the corner. So I'm just going to start. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I'm just going to go praise him. Thank you. And come with me. Got to stay right in your lane. You got to stay on track. You got to stay right in the zone so that when the blessing comes and the reward comes, we can get the full benefit of the fight of faith that we've been fighting in. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, let me ask the Holy Ghost if there's anything else he wants me to say. And then we'll wrap up. All right. I think that's it. Um, let me tell y'all one more thing I need you to do. Um, I want you to watch the YouTube videos. When you are trying to meditate, and what I'm saying, um, it's easier if you watch the YouTube videos because the scriptures are actually on the screen as I'm talking. So I know I put them sometimes on the Facebook thing, but also you can look them up. So let me give you the uh, my YouTube link. And there it is. It's in the comments. I'm not going to put it like up on the thing because I won't make any sense. But my YouTube link is in the comments. Excuse me. So go to my YouTube page and subscribe to that page. And when you want to review these words and you want to study and meditate on what you heard, watch the YouTube video because the scriptures actually be on the screen.
okay? And then, because it's very, very important that you read the scriptures for yourself, okay? All right, amen, God bless you, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I don't do what I do for money, but if you wanna bless me financially, uh, you can donate to my cash app. So I'll put my cash app on the screen. Um, uh, uh, I've been talking to you for a long time about this music I'm re-releasing, but there's a reason I'm re-releasing it. I'm re-releasing it because the Lord has shown me a new level of anointing in the music and how his spirit and his presence is coming in the room. And then I have my hymn project. I release, I have 150 hymns because uh, a new hymn for every song. And I release one hymn a month on the first Friday of every month. Then that have my No More Genies teaching, which is on the second Thursday. I just did it last Thursday, second Thursday night of every month, where we get rid of our genie concept of God and we get into the biblical concept of God, what the Bible actually says. Okay, and I have so much more stuff on the horizon. Uh, uh, oh, somebody bless me. Uh, play, praise God. Thank you so much for blessing me uh, with that offer because it helps me do even more of what I'm doing. Um, and so I can't thank you enough. So thank you so much for your support. But, you know, again, the reason I'm out, I'm out here is because we want, I want to let God use my life and, and, and use me as a vessel to breathe out his word because there is no greater honor. And the reason I say that is because those of you that have a call on your life, listen to it. Listen to it. God wants to use you. It doesn't have to look like anybody else. For too long, see, that's why I do a whole thing on Gene Concept. In the black church, we have given people the impression that if you're not a preacher, if you're not a musician, or if you're not an usher, you ain't really serving God. That's incorrect. That's very old school, but I know a lot of people still believe that. Um, God needs people in government. God needs people on the state center level, mayors, uh, school principals, superintendents, uh, police officers, uh, teachers, architects. See, whatever you do, there are people in the Bible that weren't preachers, okay? They serve God in their capacity. That's what I mean when I say, if there's a call of God on your life, listen to it, but don't get the idea in your head that that means you have to open up a Periscope channel and teach the Bible every day. That's not what that means. That means that whatever it is the Lord needs you to do so he can use your life in whatever thing he's created you for. You see that? All right. Amen and God bless. Again, I'm just so excited about the future. We're going to just start praising him, <clears throat> put on some praise and worship music, talk to people of faith. Don't get around on unbelief. Uh, don't be dissuaded by what you see. Just praise him. Praise him because the Holy Ghost says it's just around the corner. It's just around the corner. That means we're about to hit the tape. We're about to hit the end of the marathon and we're going to hit the tape. Just around the corner. So I'm excited. All right. So, hey, man, God bless. Don't forget to watch your YouTube videos. I will be here next Sunday at my regular time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the weekly live uh, prophetic word. And uh, I can't wait to show you all the new stuff. I'm uh, putting, putting it together as fast as I can. Don't forget to check out my quarter four prophetic devotional because you need the prophetic in your life. Uh, let me uh, give you that link. Um, because somebody asked me before, can you put the link in the comments? I will put the link in the comments. You need to develop your own walk with God. Let me say that one more time. You need to develop your own prophetic walk with God. Okay. And so the reason I put this daily prophetic devotional together is so that you could do just that. So that you could walk with God and talk with God and have the Holy Spirit teach you uh, about getting prophetic words, about prophetic exegesis of scripture, about um, uh, having the Lord speak to you because uh, the prophetic is for everybody, okay? The prophetic is for everybody, okay? So you don't have to walk in the office of a prophet. Every Christian is supposed to prophesy and be in their own prophetic flow. So that's why I put together that prophetic devotional so you can develop your own prophetic with God. Okay, so you can check that out. I'll put the link in the comments. Comments. So again, thank you so much. 
those of you that are listening to me on the podcast, those of you that are watching me live, and those of you that are watching any level of replay on Periscope, on Facebook, or on YouTube, but I want you to watch it on YouTube because there's more on the screen to help you study. Uh, thank you so much. Don't forget to like and share because we wanted to bless as many pe people uh, as possible. And don't forget, we're just around the corner. We're just around the corner. Let that resonate in your head. We're just around the corner. It's just around the corner. Amen and amen. All right. I will see you next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I want to hear your testimonies because I know God is going to do great things this week. And when the Lord shows up and the Lord shows out, we need to give him the glory. So next week, this time when you come on, let me hear your testimonies because I know God's going to do some great things. All right. Amen and amen. God bless. I will see you uh, next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. Amen and amen. Tries to threaten, and sickness is his weapon to fill my days with strife and cut me off.